Okay, thanks all very much for joining us here today. Uh, my name is Joshua Tucker. I'm the director of the Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia at NYU. And I'm joined as always by my co-host here, Alexander Cooley, who is the director of the Harriman Institute at Columbia University. And we wanna uh, thank the Carnegie Corporation of New York for its continued support of this ongoing New York City uh, Russia public policy series. Um, we've been running these now for a few years and just to give a quick introduction, the idea behind this joint collaboration between NYU and Columbia and between the Jordan Center and the Harriman Institute is to try to bring together scholars who study Russia, um, but with also with practitioners who are involved in working in Russia or working with Russia or journalists who are covering Russia or all sorts of things like that in order to speak to important public policy pressing issues. So to try to build a bridge between academic research and sort of important matters of the day. And, uh, and I can tell you this particular event was not on our, our schedule for the spring semester. And so, but in some ways, I think it shows the, the value of this workshop and the seminar that we have this infrastructure in place and we're able to quickly to react um, when events do come up. And so uh, without further ado, I wanna pass this over to Alex Cooley, who is going to introduce our session and introduce our speakers. And just to give a quick heads up about the logistical aspects of this, we've asked each of the speakers to uh, speak uh, for about 10 to 12 minutes to kick things off here, maybe a few more minutes uh, to kick things off here. And then we will have question and answer. Uh, given that it's a webinar format, the way that we'll handle question and answer is that you guys will put your questions in the audience in the Q in the button by pressing Q&A in the lower right hand corner here. And, uh, and, and what we want to encourage you to is even though we're not going to interrupt the speakers while they're talking, you should feel free to put your questions in there while they're speaking. And that way we'll have a nice long list of questions when we've had the opening remarks from all the panelists. And we'll use those questions as well as our own responses to engage them in dialogue. So Alex, over to you. Yeah, thanks very much, Josh. And welcome to everyone. Thank you for sharing your lunch hours or um, earlier or later hours. Um, with us today. We have a wonderful panel, four distinguished experts on Russian and Ukrainian matters. Um, and we, we put on this special session really in response to what had been happening over the last couple of months, uh, especially the amassing of more than 100,000 Russian troops uh, next to Ukraine's borders um, and the tensions that this has generated as well as reactions uh, by the Biden administration, um, by the EU. Um, Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu commented that the forces had demonstrated their ability to provide a credible defense for the country. And so we're going to ask the question, well, what were the drivers behind this large Russian military buildup? Did they achieve their objectives? Um, did uh, the reactions of EU and U.S. officials play a positive role in encouraging a de-escalation? Are we seeing even a de-escalation? Everything's ripped from the headlines. Um, so we're uh, going to go. I will introduce our speakers in the order um, that they come up. And so uh, everyone gets uh, about 10 minutes each. Josh gave you an extra two minutes. Um, that's his generosity, not Columbia's. Uh, but let's start with uh, Olga Olker, who's program director for Europe and Central Asia at the International Crisis Group in Brussels. Uh, and Olga, of course, uh, uh, experienced analyst, uh, observer, of uh, you know Russian security uh, issues, uh, both in her current role, but also previously uh, at think tanks and leading policy institutes in the states, and she is also um, adjunct professor of European and uh, Eurasian studies at SICE Europe. Uh, Olga, welcome. Thank you. Um, so, and thanks, uh, thanks all attendees. Um, I'm going to take my 10 to 12 minutes and start off with a quick what happened uh, before going into, but what really happened. Uh, so what happened? Um, in late March of this very year, 2021, we saw Russia begin deploying more troops towards Ukraine and um, Western Russia. Uh, continuing this process into early April. I think Michael's gonna talk a little bit more about the specifics of that, but um, look, we saw an influx of people and equipment on the one hand onto the Crimean Peninsula and on the other towards Voronezh, which isn't that close to Ukraine, but you know, depending on traffic, you could probably get from Voronezh to the Ukrainian border in four or five hours. Troops were coming from all over Russia. They were setting up a base camp. The Ukrainians got nervous. Now, when you talk about over 100,000 troops, they talked about 100,000 troops back the previous summer. 
Um, you know, there are a lot of Russian troops around. Russia is around and uh, Crimea is more and more militarized. There are generally a lot of Russian troops around Ukraine. But, you know, this, this was a buildup and it was happening alongside a pretty substantial um, by the standards of violence on the line of uh, separation in um, between Ukraine, um, between territory controlled by Ukraine and territory control not controlled by Ukraine. Um, there'd been a bit of an uptick of violence there. Uh, a ceasefire, the most successful ceasefire since the start of the war, which had been signed in July of 2020, started falling apart at the end of last year. And aside from the fact that you were just seeing more sniper activity uh, on some bombardment, you were also seeing a different dynamic in terms of who's getting killed and wounded in that more Ukrainian forces were actually getting killed and wounded than the Russian backed separatist forces, which was a flip of the usual pattern. Um, the Ukrainians said that the Russians were moving forces in a way that threatened them and Ukraine's president began a tour of Western capitals and also Ankara, looking for support and making a lot of noises about wanting a fast path to NATO membership. So why were the Ukrainians so nervous? Um, the Russians were saying this, these were normal training exercises on the one hand. On the other hand, you had all these different Russian officials saying something else. They were saying that they were concerned that Kiev was planning a surprise attack on the regions uh, that these Russian backed separatists have run since the war began in 2014. Uh, perhaps uh, the Russians were saying the Ukrainians had been emboldened by Azerbaijan's successful reacquisition late last year of territory Armenia had held since 1994, um, which they got back in a bloody but comparatively short war. Various Russians, uh, including Dmitry Kozak, who's the Kremlin's man on Ukraine, indicated that if Kiev did, you know, take that sort of foolhardy action, Russia would have to intervene to protect its citizens, its citizens being the people living in um, non-government controlled Ukraine who have accepted Russia's offer of Russian passports. So there is no evidence that I've seen to suggest that Ukraine was building up its forces. And Kazakh actually also said that there was no evidence that he'd seen that Ukraine was building up its forces. So from Kiev's perspective, Russia talking that way might mean that it was looking for an excuse, that it was putting forces in place in order to escalate once an opportunity to do so presented itself or was created. And some in saying that we're remembering uh, 2008 when um, Russia, after warning Georgia for years about overstepping in South Ossetia and Abkhazia, um, waited you know, until Georgia arguably took some bait and did begin offensive operations to move decisively uh, against Belisi. So from Kiev's perspective, the fear was that Russia might not even wait for the Ukrainians to do something not terribly bright and would simply pr pretend that they had. Um, and that was one concern. So of course, Zelensky got no promises of a NATO fast track, which is not possible even if uh, there had been consensus of any sort among NATO members that they want Ukraine to be one of them and there is no such consensus. He got lots of vague statements for support for Ukraine's territorial integrity. The United States said it was sending two warships to the Black Sea, but then Turkey said the United States was not sending two warships to the Black Sea. Um, the UK said it was also going to be sailing in that direction. Uh, technically unrelated, but quite, um, quite co coincidentally, uh, the US uh, started talking to Russia about a summit later in the summer and on April 15th imposed a new package of sanctions promised for months, which weren't tied to, to the current buildup. They were tied to the solar winds hacks and various odds and ends of past election interference and the continuing occupation of Crimea. Uh, the Americans also withdrew some diplomats. Also at about the same, in the same time, the Czech Republic announced that it had determined that Russian military intelligence was responsible for an ammunition uh, depot explosion in 2014. So it was also withdrawing diplomats. A few other European countries withdrew diplomats, then the Russians said they were withdrawing their own diplomats. Um, they also put some restrictions on missions in Russia. So for the United States, for instance, can no longer hire local staff which led the United States to say, well, if that happens, we can't process visas. So you've got this little cycle of escalation that isn't actually about Ukraine, but is going on that starts at about the same time. So as the cycle of escalation is cycling along uh, on April 20th, the Russian defense minister announces that, hey, we're good, training's over, troops are gonna be pulling back, everything went well. Now this isn't quite as great as you might think, um, 
because, well, first of all, uh, naval and air exercises around Crimea continued. And second, the pullback was uh, personnel only. So they were gonna keep the equipment um, still around in Western Russia and ostensibly so it could be available in September for exercises with Belarus. But the crisis was over. So, okay, if that's what happened, what really happened, right? Did Russia, as the Russian pundits insist, deter Ukraine from a foolhardy attack? Um, that seems unlikely because, as I said, there's not a lot of evidence Ukraine was planning a foolhardy attack. Um, and it would indeed have been foolhardy. This said, deterring people from things they aren't planning to do anyway does tend to have a high success rate and is very popular. Um, you might have noticed the 82nd Airborne purse shooting into Estonia a few days ago, also an, a brilliant way of deterring a thing that isn't planned. So was Russia deterred from the attack Ukraine feared by lots of European statements and Washington's unrelated sanctions and the spate of diplomatic expulsions? Uh, I've got my doubts about that one too, because I don't think the Russians were planning to launch a new offensive in the first place. So again, um, and also these things are completely unrelated. So, you know, if you can deter with things that vague, I mean, maybe you can, but really hard to link it long-term. Did Russia prove that Ukraine couldn't count on Western military support in the event of a threat? Maybe. But again, nobody was convinced it was a real threat and probably everybody already knew that Ukraine couldn't count on Western military support. So when I look at all of this, um, a few things I think are interesting. Um, one is that the fact that the Russians did decide to do something to build up suggests that they, maybe they weren't as happy with the status quo as we all had thought. Right, the conventional wisdom is that the Minsk agreements favor Russia, that it has time on its side or thinks it does. But this wasn't a routine training exercise, right? Um, while I'm not 100% sure what exactly they were trying to do, they were trying to shake things up. So that's interesting. And the other thing I find interesting is that everybody was signaling madly, right? These military exercises were meant to signal something. Uh, the West sanctions and diplomatic expulsions are meant to signal things. The Ukrainians and their state visits are also meant to signal things. The Europeans meeting with the Ukrainians meant to signal things. The Turks meeting with the Ukrainians, but also announcing uh, where American ships are and aren't going, signals. So the Ukrainians, you know, it's pretty clear they were trying to get some support and remind Russia that they have friends, if not always reliable ones, and they were trying to get NATO membership in the headlines, if not in the actual plans. Okay, that's clear. But Western countries, and Western analysts, myself included, spent several weeks trying to figure out what Russia's military exercises meant. Now, from my perspective, that doesn't speak well for anybody's capacity to send or read signals very well. Similarly, if the sanctions were simply meant to signal Western discontent with all the things that they signal Western discontent about, okay, they did that. But equally surely, the Russians were pretty sure that the Westerners were not content. So were they necessary? And what exactly were they meant to do? And what did they do? That said, if the Russians wanted to shake things up and get some attention, they did that. They've got a summit coming up. Uh, the question is, where will everyone go from here? And I'll close by saying that here's what I worry about. I worry that if everybody walks away from something like this thinking that they deterred everybody else, um, we can expect more fun signaling that is hard to read and that might prove escalatory. This said, I think we can probably also be a bit relieved that everybody isn't walking away feeling like they lost miserably and plotting how to get revenge. So I will close there. Super, thank you so much. And also for that absolutely in intriguing um, take on, on signaling and the reminder that everything seems to be about signaling these days. Uh, next up, uh, Michael Kaufman, who's a senior research scientist in the Russia Studies program at CNA, also fellow at the Kennan Institute, the Woodrow Wilson International Center in Washington, D.C., uh, an astute observer of Russian uh, security uh, and military uh, matters. Uh, Michael, what's your take on everything that's happening? Sure. Uh, thanks, Alex. Thanks for the kind uh, invitation to participate in this. So I think Willie has done a wonderful job. I guess I'll take some color crayons and try to color in uh, this great uh, outline she gave us on what happened uh, with some, some additions and a few details. Uh, first, on kind of the, the origins of military movements, who did first when, 
I think early on, two things happened. There was a breakdown of what had been the longest standing ceasefire uh, early in the winter. And there were early Russian military exercises as well in Crimea in February with some airborne forces that never withdrew. And then, as Ole described, the Russian military began stacking on top of that in Crimea and northeast of Ukraine, just south of Voronezh. This was significant because it was the largest military buildup that anyone had seen in Crimea since Russia annexed it. And they had never deployed such a large amount of forces there before. And then it wasn't clear what they were doing in Voronezh as why. Because Russia, since 2014, has deployed pretty large permanent standing formations around Ukraine's borders as part of several combined arms armies. So they have divisions and brigades essentially ringing Ukraine from Ukraine's northern border with Belarus all the way across to Crimea, right? Which means that they don't really need additional forces to be brought in. So it becomes very clear and very overt. Um, and as Oli described, Russia, Russian military did begin building up. What we really saw was them bringing in the 58th Army from Southern Military District in the North Caucasus into Crimea, and then the 41st Army in Central Military District, several thousand kilometers away into Voronezh, and then about three different airborne divisions being involved in the buildup as well. Some units from Skov up uh, uh, not far from St. Petersburg, and some units from down south, right? So there's a bunch of airborne is, uh, involved as well. Um, I think the troop numbers that were really added to the region were smaller in general than people reported in the news. This number was pretty overhyped because what was happening in the media is they were mixing permanently deployed Russian forces stationed near Ukraine's borders in Russia with the influx of forces, and they were generating a pretty high overall total number. Um, all right, so that said, it, the deployment was very visible and it was very overt. They weren't trying to hide it. And when they massed forces, they massed them in staging areas and they were still a ways off from the border such that you could tell, at least from a military analyst kind of nerd perspective, that the Russian military would have to then deploy towards the border in assembly areas and then disperse in formations, which would have been a much clearer indicator of the intention to conduct offensive operations. But looking at it, the intentions were not that obvious, to be perfectly frank. If you believe it was super easy to look at this deployment and know for a fact what Russian intentions were, that was not the case. You could have safely argued that Russia had enough military power to conduct a limited offensive operation of about a week to two in duration with a fairly sizable amount of military power built up around Ukraine, although that was a low probability event. So in this regard, I would say that actually most experts got this right by interpret, please those who interpret this as a case of course of diplomacy and military signaling versus those who lean more towards the panicking side of, oh, there's going to be an offensive operation. And, and some extent we can pat ourselves on the back, but I think we've done a lot better in being to assess uh, this situation than the way events unfolded in 2014, all right? Um, now, uh, what's happening today? So after the deployment in April, Shoigu then said they were drawing by May 1st. Then Gerasimov came out later in April, as always often happens. So actually when Shoigu said that what he meant his personnel would be withdrawn by May 1st, it took us a month to build up. So unless like with the power of magic, there's no way we can withdraw this amount of military power in one week. It took us four weeks to deploy. So he then elaborated and said, no, actually we're going to withdraw most of the gear by May 12th. Okay, personnel will go back. Most of the gear returns by May 12th. It'll take well over two weeks. And they're going to leave some equipment in Voronezh belonging to the 41st Army from Central Military District. Not all, but some, while the personnel goes back to their army. Why? They say they intend to use it in Zappa 2021. I'll be honest, I don't really believe this reasoning, but the point being is they're keeping it there and it's staying and it's not clear how much yet. So that's something to watch and observe. Now, Regarding the reasoning for this, well, for the actual deployment. Well, as Olya alluded, there were different confounding explanations from the Russian side. I detected at least three. Olya spoke to Kozaks, which Kozak himself didn't seem to believe. So I will not cover that one because Kozak himself was uncertain whether he believed what he was saying. There were two others. One was from Zaharova, who at one point during the conversation came out and tied the linkage to the prospect of a sort of NATO membership action plan essentially suggesting that if this was advanced to Ukraine, there would be a tremendous escalation of stability in Donbass, and that would lead to the destruction of the Ukrainian state. So that was a pretty over threat and a pretty clear chain of events that was being drawn from what, what happens uh, if somebody decides to spend political capital to push, uh, to create a road to NATO for Ukraine. Not that, not that I think that this is a serious near or medium term prospect for Ukraine. And Turkey Shoigu, who of course said something completely different. And he said that this is really about 
U.S. operations near Russia's borders and Defender 2021 has nothing, he didn't say anything about Ukraine at all and made entirely about uh, ongoing U.S. NATO exercises and sustained U.S. military operations near Russia. This is in some ways meant to signal Russian military power, mobility, and, and meant as a response. Uh, my net takeaway on this kind of bottom line up front is that uh, this was an attempt for course of diplomacy, diplomacy backed by the threat of force, uh, or in some cases, limited use of force. It is not a tremendous success story for course of diplomacy, but that's in the eye of the analyst and the eye of the beholders what matters. What matters is what the Kremlin walked away thinking they achieved with this and the kind of signals they sent. Remember, political leaders interpret outcomes of events very differently from military analysts and don't necessarily use the same logical process at all uh, in terms of what's meaningful to them. Um, this is to me not at all a deterrent success story either. Actually, the military signaling and diplomatic messaging alignment was very bad, especially in the United States side. There was a lot of things that didn't seem to quite go well there in my point of view. Um, and on the Russian side, I don't think there was an intent to conduct an offensive operation. So if anything, they were themselves self-deterred. And I probably shake out in big picture closer to Olya's view on this, uh, that you know, looking at this interaction and military signaling, Robert Jervis, Robert Jervis was in this conversation. He'd probably have a lot of fun with his adage that in these interactions, confusion and stupidity are rarely given their true due, which is what happens between states trying to engage in military signal. Uh, and last brief points here about the real military balance for those that are interested in this. And I'll do a very, very short piece on this, large part because Alex asked me to. Um, and that is, so where are we in 2021 in terms of the military balance between these states? Russia has considerable quantitative and qualitative superiority across the board over Ukraine. Russian military capabilities has improved dramatically since 2014. I know many people talk about the improvement in Ukraine's military force and Ukraine's capability. This is true, but it's important that people understand that Russia has not stood still at all as a military in terms of its readiness, mobility, capability, and so on and so forth, modernization. The positional advantage is decidedly to Russia, given it completely rings Ukraine today with fairly large permanently deployed formations and very good backing supporting formations and second echelons, all right? There's also a lot of experience in the Russian military, which wasn't as much the case in 2014, and very high readiness levels throughout the units, although some of them are not yet complete that are being built up around Ukraine. Next part, offensive operations are not synonymous with territorial conquest. A lot of people wrongly assume that Russia would be intended to conduct further territorial conquest in Ukraine. To my point of view, that was never the goal. The goal is always about imposing Russian will on Ukraine and a say over Ukraine's strategic orientation, never capturing territory and holding on to it. That was not the objective. I always felt that the water crisis situation in Ukraine was overwrought as a reason and somewhat impractical. The scare has come up literally every single spring. Uh, and the last big one was in 2018. The reason for that is first, seizing Kherson Oblast and establishing a new land corridor to it uh, would be a pretty sizable military operation. Uh, second, it would create a whole host of new challenges and dilemmas for the Russian military in occupying a region. It's very difficult to occupy a region the way it looks on a map, because suddenly you find out that that region depends on electricity, water, food supplies from elsewhere. In fact, that's how they got into the mess by annexing Crimea in the first place and figuring out that Crimea depend entirely on Ukraine for everything else. Uh, last, it would not immediately resolve the water crisis. People think that that water canal is like a pipe, and maybe if you seize the top of it, you just open this valve and all the water comes through. But it's been closed and not maintained in parts for some time, so it's not clear that they would even get water to Crimea in the first year, year and a half from taking that over. It's not obvious that, that it's a, it's a turn-on switch that you could just fix uh, when you have a drought in the summer. Um, I have military figures. I'm not going to bore people with them because they're deeply interesting to me, but I doubt they're going to be very interesting to anybody else in terms of the military balance. I'll speak very briefly to the Ukrainian side of it. Uh, I think Ukraine has a decent sized force deployed around Donbass. Uh, a lot of the figures that are given out are pretty notional, though. Um, Ukraine's forces exceed those of the separatists, but not by a dramatic amount, and in turn, overall, overmatched by the Russian military deployed around them. Here's the truth. I hear a lot of stories in these discussions I've been about the tremendous progress Ukrainian military has made. All of that is true. However, uh, we need to be frank about some things. First, Ukrainian forces forward deployed east of the Dnieper River in this area are probably being manned at 50 to 60% levels, okay? This is hard truth number one, all right? Second, a lot of the veterans who fought in this war, the story of the battle-hardened military 
have cycled out. The officers have experience, but a lot of people that were in that early fighting are no longer necessarily part of the force. Okay, most of the fighting, as Ukraine, uh, sorry, as Olya described, has been positional warfare with sniper and ATGM use as a sniper weapon, anti-tank guided missile use of cyber weapon. It is a highly effective offensive weapon. Uh, Ukraine's military no longer depends on civilians for logistics. That's true. It's not a shambles that it was in 2014 that had to cobble itself as a fighting force. It's much better trained and, and, and institutionalized and integrated, but that's the reality. We shouldn't oversell the story. So in a short, sharp war, it would be tremendously disadvantaged in a fight with Russian forces. And I think both sides know that and understand that. And the conflict would not at all be prolonged, personally, just speaking, watching it from the the early years of 2014, 2015. And it's not clear that if anybody even wanted to offer military aid to Ukraine, that they would have sufficient time to provide anything meaningful to Ukrainian forces to change the outcome of the war. It's not clear that the span of the conflict would allow. Okay, I hope I stuck within my time and I'm wrapping up right now and turn it over back to Alex. Thanks. Michael, thanks so much for that. And also for, for circling back to give us a sense what, what the military balance is um, in the region. Uh, moving on, our next speaker is uh, Paulina Sinovets, who's the head of the Odessa Center for Non-Proliferation and associate professor in the International Relations Department at the Odessa uh, Mechnikov National University, also a Ponar's Eurasia member. Uh, Paulina, welcome. Uh, thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here and to listen to such a fascinating presentations. Uh, well, I would um, probably not be so wide in my um, presentation. Uh, and starting from and concentrating probably on the Russian motivation and Russian strategic culture. So uh, first, I would like to start from the word that uh, from citing epicenters that um, men are not afraid of things, uh, but the way they perceive them. So I believe that um, the fear uh, is one of the most important drivers which, um, you know, pushed Russia to escalate along the Ukrainian borders. Here I would like to uh, define between two kinds of fears. Uh, one is the fear of losing face and the other is the fear of losing its strategic depth. Uh, probably I would repeat some thoughts which uh, have already been here, but uh, anyway, I think that uh, it's, uh, it means that they're the right things. Um, so first, uh, speaking about the face, you know, that um, Russians uh, has always perceived themselves as sort of uh, the ultimate truth, uh, like a God bears nation, you know, citing Dostoevsky, the nation which brings um, uh, higher traditional moral values, uh, like a sort of the Christ loving warriors fighting the Antichrist, which is usually associated with the West and with the liberal values, which is uh, now you know, carried by the West. So Russians are perceiving themselves as the, you know, the ultimate symbol of uh, the traditional truth. And of course, it's uh, very much unpleasant for them when this uh, bright and shiny image is broken by um, the, um, you know, agreement, first of all, like agreement of President Biden that Putin is a killer, right? Of course, it's Putin, but Putin uh, is usually associating himself with Russia. And therefore, it's not only Biden words about Putin, who is the killer, but it's also the disrespect from um, the West, starting from uh, the Navalny case. And then it's this disrespect from Ukraine, who first, you know, uh, stopped supplying water to Crimea unexpectedly, and then um, um, imposing sanctions on the Putin's uh, closest friend, uh, oligarch Medvedchuk who was one of the elements of Russian propaganda, uh, Russian propaganda in Ukraine. So his channels were closed and so on. And again, it was sort of the face slapping to Putin, uh, who believed he is a strong leader who should be respected, sh who should be, you know, um, treated well uh, with a sort of respect. And of course, it was uh, very much um, unpleasant and so Russia just wanted to show that um, they can do something um, and they can you know curse um, all rivals including the US and Ukraine uh, by uh, some kind of uh, rapid um, demonstration of force. So what I mean here is um, if we refer to the president's address to the Federal Assembly uh, recently, we, we can, you know, remember th that he said that everyone is speaking uh, Russia now here and there. 
and that um, they are probably misperceiving Russia's uh, peacefulness and uh, Russia's uh, patience as um, weakness or as um, ignorance. But those who are going to burn up bridges will face uh, the asymmetric, uh, swift and tough response from Russia. So I think that uh, by uh, deploying the troops simultaneously along the Ukrainian border, it was sort of the uh, demonstration that yes, we can take Ukraine over. Uh, it and it will be a pretty much a symmetric and a swift and tough reply to uh, the actions uh, of um, all rivals. Of course, uh, probably it was not really credible, but anyway, the deployment of troops were so much credible that no one was uh, really. Um, knowing of what we should expect from Russia, taking um, considering the fact that Putin is not always or tries to present as not always a super rational actor. Um, so uh, number two, uh, this is the fear of Russia for its uh, strategic depth. What I mean here is that um, originally Russia was created by the principle of gathering lands. Uh, when Russia, you know, Moscow uh, Kingdom was uh, conquering uh, the territories, uh, the neighboring territories, and then taking them with a strong hand, uh, preventing them from uh, drifting away. Uh, so this, um, they, it gave Russian uh, territory, um, Russia, the idea of the sacredness of this uh, territory and the scale of the territory. Plus, um, if we look at the Russian history, we'll see that all invasions uh, on Russia uh, were pretty unsuccessful, starting from Napoleon, ending up with Hitler, when the Russian strategic depth and Russian territory made a real sense there, while heavy winters, lack, uh, lack of supply, you know, the resistance of Russian people, all of this played the fact that um, uh, all uh, who tried it to conquer Russia were finally defeated and it was the, and the Russian strategic depth actually played a role there. And it was in the times when Russia was uh, distance from its western borders in uh, about 1,300 miles, while uh, you know today uh, this distance shortened just to 500 miles. And I think that uh, for Russia, uh, the meaning of Ukraine was really is really uh, very important. And of course, uh, this uh, speculations, not speculations, but the phrases of President Zelensky of uh, Ukraine. Uh, integrating NATO, that the uh, only option for Ukraine to resolve this issue, uh, its uh, problems is uh, the NATO integration. Of course, it caused the immediate reaction of the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and um, uh, the words that uh, even the hypothetical integration of Ukraine to NATO would uh, increase uh, the escalation of South uh, in the Southeast tremendously and also would be critical to the Ukrainian statehood. Uh, so I think that it was a very uh, brightly drawn um, red line of Russia. And plus, again, referring to the Federal Assembly speech, we can um, remember that Putin said that Russia is drawing its red lines now and those who are going to cross it will uh, regret it has never as much as it, it has never regret before uh, so it was also the way to show that um, you know th that red lines uh, which included of course the integration of ukraine to the western bloc uh, should have never been crossed so uh, summing up um this uh, Coercion uh, was probably one of the main drivers. Uh, coercion of the Western uh, of the United States, coercion of Ukraine, trying to make Ukraine more complying with uh, the uh, demands of Russia in the Minsk agreements. Again, to make uh, the US more complying in the dialogue, just not to forget that President Biden called Putin. Uh, so after a first time after he called him the killer, he called him personally and suggested to meet. So it was a big progress, I think, that Putin felt that now he is more or less uh, started to be satisfied. But what is interesting that in this conflict that I uh, perceive it as the way of uh, the, the strategic coercion of coercion strategies uh, build up. So it was the demonstration of capability, gathering of uh, troops along the Ukrainian border. Then it was the ultimatum, which Putin uh, focalized in his um, address to the Federal Assembly. And then it and then uh, he just started to withdraw the troops, showing that he is you know, full of peaceful intentions. However, no troops were uh, fully withdrawn, you know, 
uh, most of the military structures remain uh, along the border. So, if, so he just stands there and waits how these words were uh, listened to or, or perceived uh, by his rivals, whether they will uh, comply with uh, what Putin wants to show them with the signal signals. I think that it's also um, uh, sort of the reminiscent uh, to the uh, world uh, Putin imagines um, should be uh, in the way that um, uh, in 2015, in his Valdez speech, he um, said that mm, there were golden times of uh, Nikita Khrushchev when everyone was respecting Khrushchev in spite of his eccentric behavior. Because everyone knew that, you know, Nikita has a bomb, big bomb, don't mess with Nikita. Of course, uh, Putin also has a big bomb. And he uh, also preferred uh, everyone not to mess with him. However, of course, nuclear argument would never be credible in the situation of, uh, you know, such kind of offenses from the side of President Biden or President Zelensky. They're very small things. However, I think that this kind of um, large scale deployment of uh, the Russian troops along the Ukrainian border looks very much credible. Therefore, um, it was sort of the very credible um, coercive attempt to perceive um, the rivals, uh, to respect Russia, to look at the red lines and not to step them over. I think that's uh, what I would like to stop at. Well, you know, thanks very much for, uh, for that perspective. So uh, our final speaker today, and, and before we get to him, let me just say, if you do have uh, questions um, for our panelists, uh, please feel free to use the Q&A function on the Zoom. For those of you on YouTube, if you type in your question, it will get relayed to us. Um, so please feel free to use that, um, that functionality uh, as well. Um, our final speaker needs no introduction, but he gets one anyway. It's uh, Tim Fry, who is the Marshall Shulman Professor of Post-Soviet Foreign Policy at Columbia University. He's also the Director of the International Center for the Study of Institutions and Development at the Higher School of Economics in Moscow, also my predecessor here at the Harriman Institute, and author of the new book, Weak Strongman, The Limits of Power in Putin's Russia. Uh, Tim's going to provide uh, perspective of some of the domestic developments and public opinion uh, in Russia. Tim, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks a lot. It's a really uh, a ple pleasure to speak and learn from uh, the other panelists. Uh, and thanks to Harriman and Jordan Center for, for hosting. Um, so now there's been a lot of talk in uh, the Western press that uh, the buildup of the Russian military forces around Ukraine had at least some link uh, to domestic politics, that this was, was done uh, with an eye toward, you know, halting Putin's sliding popularity and creating a rally around the flag effect uh, with echoes of uh, Crimean annexation in 2014 in mind. Um, other people have argued that this was done to distract attention away uh, from, uh, you know, kind of the embarrassment of the uh, uh, handling of uh, Alexei Navalny, uh, first the poisoning uh, and then the uh, jailing on uh, parole violations. Um, uh, so uh, there's been much argument that this was really driven in part by domestic politics. Now, you know, of course, domestic politics is, is you know, always important in, uh, 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 in, in foreign policy, um, but we need to be really careful here. There's just uh, not that much evidence uh, that this, in my view, that this was really done with an eye toward a domestic audience in mind. And I'm much more sympathetic with, you know, argument that this was done as a form of course of diplomacy as the ceasefire broke down and Zelensky started to dig in his heels and take a harder line, in part because of domestic politics in Ukraine. Um, uh, uh, those seem to me to be, you know, much stronger arguments than the, the kind of diversionary war hypothesis or diversionary scare hypothesis. Um, first of all, let's take a step back from just the, the Russia-Ukraine setting. And if we look empirically across countries, there's just not a lot of evidence for the diversionary war uh, theory. And in essence, we should see a lot more wars um, if it was the case that leaders could use military conflict you know, every time their uh, you know, political chances um, uh, became a, a lot weaker. 
Um, it's also a strange argument in that public opinion should be, um, you know, uh, so smart that people are able to, you know, pay attention to what's going on in foreign policy, which is often not the case. Most people in most countries don't care a lot about foreign policy. Um, but it does require that people should a be paying attention to, to foreign policy, but not be so smart that they can't see through the cynical motives of the leaders, which seems a little bit odd. And you know, if it's true that uh, you know, kind of diversionary war theory uh, was very persuasive, um, it has to be conditional on lots of other factors. So I just want to warn people away from these kinds of straight line arguments. Putin's popularity is falling. Uh, so we should see him rallying uh, uh, or uh, using military coercion or assert a foreign policy in order to uh, boost support, in part because it's not all that clear that the Russian politic is all that excited about a more assertive uh, foreign policy. Uh, Crimea uh, was really the great exception um, to, um, to the rule, and in part uh, because the Crimean annexation was largely bloodless for the Russian side. Uh, and if we look at kind of more assertive foreign policies and policies that could potentially be much more costly, the Russian public is actually pretty skittish about the loss of life. For example, um, support for Syria, uh, the, the Russian intervention in Syria has always been very modest and it's fallen uh, over time. Uh, Support for the annexation of Belarus is about you know one in four or one in five Russians only. Um, after the annexation, after the the the, the uh, short war with Georgia and the intervention in Syria, Putin's popularity ratings actually fell. Um, and it's especially true, I think, for Eastern Ukraine. If you look, even in 2015, less than a third of Russians supported using uh, Russian troops openly uh, in Eastern Ukraine. Uh, when asked how they would feel if it turned out that they were actually Russian soldiers um, uh, uh, fighting in eastern Ukraine, you know, basically 70% of Russians said that they wouldn't support this, this policy. Also, while Putin has said that, uh, you know, Ukraine's not a real country, uh, supposedly he said this as an aside to, to President Bush, you know, public opinion polling suggests that more than 80% of Russians uh, see Ukraine as its own country and you know, less than 20% uh, would like to see it as part of Russia. And it, it seems like the Kremlin understands this based on the near total uh, blackout of coverage on Russian military involvement in Eastern Ukraine. And you know, the threats that journalists who cover um, uh, the deaths of you know, Russian volunteers in, in Eastern Ukraine um, uh, receive suggests that you know, more information about this is not something that the Kremlin would like. Because one could imagine an alternative scenario where the Kremlin would use the deaths of these uh, volunteers in order to whip up popular sentiment at home. And it seems to be doing exactly the opposite. Um, I also uh, don't think that the military buildup was done to distract from Navalny. The Kremlin doesn't need a costly and potentially dangerous military buildup uh, to distract the public away from Navalny. Uh, the Kremlin controls the, the Russian media to such an extent that it's uh, uh, you know, easy to distract uh, uh, Russians or to denigrate Navalny or to marginalize him using tools that are much less costly than, than, than a military buildup. Um, and in essence, the, the crackdown against Navalny, I think, is better seen as you know, a long-term trend uh, in Russian politics over the last four or five years as Putin has been less able to rely on other tools in order to, um, uh, you know, to, to, to stay in power and to rule over Russia. You know, economic performance has been you know, bad for a decade. His popularity ratings have fallen and trust in Putin is about half of what it was from five years ago. Um, uh, propaganda doesn't seem to be working as well as more Russians switch to social media and away from uh, state television. There are no easy, uh, 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 high reward, low risk operations like the annex of Crimea. And you know, when, as you know, studies of other autocracies show us, you know, when these uh, less costly uh, tools become more blunt, 
then uh, autocrats tend to turn to repression as a way to um, uh, uh, shore up their uh, uh, regime. So this is not something that's unique to, unique to Russia. And you know, one could easily see a case, and this is pure speculation, I don't have any inside sources within the Kremlin, um, but you know, it, it, it's not unreasonable to think that you know, Putin would just be a lot more dependent on the security services who have been a special target of Navalny, uh, if you think of Sechin or Zolotov or uh, even Usmanov, of uh, you know them leaning on Putin to try to to, to crack down on Navalny, um, and Putin being more dependent on them and you know being willing to give the go ahead to the security services to deal with with Navalny as they best um, uh, see fit. So. Um, uh, I wouldn't look at uh, uh, the, um, the military buildup around Ukraine as a uh, driven largely by uh, domestic politics as a way to, to shore up support. Now, it's true that Russian support, um, uh, you know, Russia's newfound, recently uh, achieved a, a status as, as a global power, um, uh, but they tend to uh, attribute that or link that great power status more to historical events like uh, the, uh, World War II or to uh, achievements in uh, uh, the sciences such as launching of Sputnik and the great uh, Soviet space program rather than in you know, a, a, an assertive foreign policy. Um, so um, you know, the notion that uh, you know, the buildup around Ukraine was really done as a way to uh, create a new rally around the flag and, a, and an annexation of Crimea uh, seems, uh, seems somewhat uh, misplaced. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Tim. Thanks very much to all the panelists for the for the fascinating uh, point to kick off discussion. Again, want to encourage our uh, audience to put questions up in the Q&A or to put questions up on the YouTube channel. But I, I want to start off with a question, um, which is which I can pose to any of the panelists, but maybe maybe it starts with Tim. But how does Putin pulling back after all this sort of saber rattling that existed for a couple of weeks, how does that not, um, why are we not talking about the concern here that in pulling back, they would have looked weak for pulling back? And, 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 the, and, you know, could we be, when, when, when we conceived of this panel three weeks ago, could we just have easily been sitting here having a discussion about how Russia got trapped into doing something it didn't want to do because the costs of pulling back were too high? I mean, this seems like a kind of fairly un-Putin-like move to bring so many troops down there to encourage so much speculation about this. So I get that the coercive diplomacy is an, is an explanation if we think it was incredibly successful and they accomplished their goals that they had to accomplish. But I think it does, I just wanna push all of you a little bit because the sort of Occam's razor, you know, average Joe looking at what's happening here is that there was a big movement to the border, there was some ruffling of feathers and then the Russians backed off. And, and is this just that, is Tim like just totally right that like there's no concern about what domestic audience is here and this is all intended as messages and signals to elites and elites should have gotten messages. But then we go back to Olga's original point, right? That there were so many messages being sent and we've spent three weeks trying to figure out exactly what those messages are. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about why no one is telling a story about, about Russia and Putin being concerned that they looked weak in response to this incident. Um, and we're focusing on all these kind of success angles of it. Maybe Olga, maybe maybe to kick it off with you because it does tie into your question. Or I forget actually now I forget who said uh, it might have been Michael Olga or Michael about that at least nobody came out of this. Uh, oh yeah, Olga. At least nobody came out of this feeling like they lost. Why doesn't Russia feel a little bit like they lost coming out of this? I I can answer that pretty quickly. I think. I think they set themselves up to be able to dial down easily by saying it's a training exercise. You know what happens when you finish a training exercise? You stop. 
Um, so you don't look like you're de-escalating or doing much of anything. It, it's, it gives you room, it gives you room for growth and it gives you room for shrinkage. So I think, I think it, I think they just, it was designed to give them space to not keep it going. And because they never intended to escalate it, they just intended to make a point. It's just not clear what the point was. My sense is yeah. that, you know, the story from the Kremlin is, you know, they would never admit you know, to weakness, they were responsible, right? This is their, uh, uh, you know, they, uh, uh, you know, by pulling back, you know, they demonstrated that they were kind of responsible actor and, you know, it wasn't a sign of weakness. It was a sign of, you know, the great statesmanship uh, uh, coming from, uh, uh, coming from the, the, the Kremlin um, in this, you know, hostile world where they're all, where they're all uh, surrounded. So, you know, they have a lot of opportunity to spin this in, in a number of different ways and having multiple narratives allows them to choose, uh, uh, you know, which exit ramp uh, they, they uh, uh, would like to take. Because I, I got the impression away from this is that they, it was really just a signal to remind people that uh, 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 as Michael noticed the you know, the Ukrainian army has gotten stronger, but at the end of the day, this issue matters a lot to Russia Russia is a lot more powerful. And if they really do want to drop the hammer, um, it, it, you know, it could be quick and decisive. So I'll, I will pass before passing to Michael, I will note that both of those explanations make a ton of sense and they both are in tension with each other because you can't get credit for being a responsible states person for ending a training exercise that was scheduled to end, right? So, so maybe it's the multiple narratives. Michael? Yeah, I'll just add to that, Josh. So uh, first, the reason for why you don't have the narrative you're asking is because they never issued an ultimatum. When you issue an ultimatum, you put your credibility on the line for what you're going to do, but they never issued one. So they weren't backing down from an ultimatum because it never happened. Uh, the second part is that they actually got a response. It may not have been the exact response they wanted, but their goals were nonspecific. They got a tremendous amount of fear and concern. And they illustrate exactly what could happen to Ukraine in a large scale war. And they did get a reaction both from Ukraine from Ukraine's partners and allies and from us. And so they did get something and they never issued an ultimatum for what they specifically want. Third, as Ole alluded, the costs were very low. There were no clear risks for them. They were actually in control of the situation basically the whole time. And they successfully framed it pretty ambiguously. So there were no kind of like real audience costs, right? Either domestic or international. Um, and, and so in that regard, I think, I think that the narrative that came out of it makes sense. As a counterfactual, this would have played out very interestingly, of course, if they had deployed and then they said, Ukraine, open up the water channel to Crimea or something else, like a specific deliverable that Ukraine had to do, that they were trying to compel Ukraine to do it. Then the United States would have come in and said, no, Ukraine, you don't have to do that. We back you, support you, maybe. And then we would have seen how it would have played out as a coercive bargaining game. But that's not quite how this, how this uh, story goes. Paulina, did you want to add anything? Um, well, um, I think that um, as far as um, if we regard it um, from, not from the international standpoint, but from the internal one, um, I've seen that um, looking at the uh, latest Levada Center polls, uh, most of the Russian people uh, blamed Ukraine for uh, this uh, escalation, saying that this is because Ukraine started to move uh, troops in Donbass or uh, whatsoever, so just uh, like the end of ceasefire. And um, as, as I know that um, during this escalation and during the la latest weeks, uh, Ukrainian soldiers had a very strict uh, order not to reply for any provocation. So anyway, if Russia, if Putin is going to come back uh, and to end this trainings, uh, he just can tell uh, all Russian people that now Ukrainians are behaving in the way they should behave. They became cautious. They stepped back in Donbas. So Russians just supported the right of the uh, this uh, you know people uh, Donbas and Luhansk people republics. And now Ukrainians won't be as reckless as they tried to be before. This is the usual uh, you know explanation. All right. Okay. All right. So thanks. Thanks very much for those answers. Um, I'm going to turn to the Q and A. Now, and we've gotten a couple questions that have come in about uh, one potential audience, audience uh, intended audience here that may not that was not brought up in the discussion, which is the question of China. So we have one question asking from David Shaw, asking, "Is there any indication of coordination of Russia's escalation of tensions in Ukraine with China's escalation of tensions over Taiwan?" And Ted Kerber asking, "Nobody mentioned China, and I'm wondering if perhaps Xi was a potential audience for the buildup." 
Russia seeks to walk a fine line with China, trying to portray itself as an equal partner to, despite China's economic dominance. Flashing evidence of Russia's military might could be part of a strategy to actively demonstrate Russia's military prowess and willingness to take tough actions. So is there a China element to this story that hasn't been discussed yet? I mean, it hasn't been discussed, but I think for good reason, because I, I don't think that's a very strong angle in this case. So it's a very interesting thought. And I think it's really fascinating when people bring this creative perspective to a crisis that others or those of us on this panel may have overlooked. I'm not sure China is a very strong audience here that Russia ever had any problems in terms of its course of credibility. If anything, Russia typically has like kind of the opposite effect of uh, Wilhelmian politics that has so much coercive credibility and it's so kind of crude in terms of how it uses uh, coercive power in pursuit of political goals that uh, people get very, people assume the worst and they assume maximalist intentions on the part of Russia, even with a limited military deployment like this, All right? So if anything, Russia's kind of overwrought in terms of coercive credibility and I don't think it needs to impress any other powers uh, about uh, its military capability or its willingness to use it. Fair enough. So let's move on to a question from uh, Professor Tariq Saril Amar, who is joining us, I believe, from Istanbul. So to all presenters, any comments on the role of EU, Europe, or specific member states in either the events themselves or the perception strategies of Russia and Ukraine? Uh, many thanks in advance. Olga, you're, you're there in Brussels. Maybe we'll, we'll go to you first on this, on the EU role and reactions. So Zelensky didn't ask for EU help, he asked for NATO help, right? His tour was of NATO, you know, NATO capitals and EU capitals overlap, but he went to Ankara, um, which does not overlap. And again, what he, there's the conversation he was having with Erdogan, with Macron, with Merkel, that was in newspapers. And then there's the conversations he was actually having with them quietly. And for the newspapers, he was asking for, a, you know, NATO membership action plan, which he knew was he wasn't going to get, and they knew they weren't going to give to him. But again, as I said, it gets it into the headlines, and you know, plays a little bit to Ukraine and to the audience there that our president's still going for this, um, and it annoys the Russians. Uh, and then there's the conversation in the background where I'm pretty confident that folks like Macron and Merkel. We're talking to him about, okay, how do we de-escalate this? How do we get back to the Normandy table? How do we get back to the ceasefire, which as Polina said, had very um, very stringent requirements that nobody, nobody could shoot back basically without getting permission. That, that had fallen apart. So can we get back there? What, what would it take? And I think that's a lot of the conversation that was probably happening quietly that doesn't get reported for very good reasons. That's not the sort of thing you want to have reported. That's the sort of thing you want to sort out and then bring to the negotiating table later. Would anyone else like to take the EU part of this or maybe specific EU countries, Germany, France? No. All right, Josh. Okay, um, so now we have two questions, one from Peter Rutland and one from Elise Giuliano that are sort of pushing a little bit harder on kind of specific cause and effect relationships here. So let me ask Peter's first, which is that Biden made his killer comment on March 17th and it looks like the first deployments were March 24th. Do we have any evidence that these deployments were planned prior to the killer comments? So can we rule out that this was a response to the Biden killer comment? I think we can largely rule them out as a response. You know, nothing's 100%. But um, so first, I actually don't think the first deployments were March 24th. I think that there were early deployments even ahead of that. Uh, second, these sort of things take some time to plan and organize, and it didn't nearly look that sort of a, a snap deployment. Third, I, I very much appreciate the question and the thesis here. But as always, when we see one thing following another, I don't see a causal relationship between them. And I will get ahead of another question I've already heard from journalists, which is, do people think that Biden offered Putin a summit 
you know, as a result of this, and I will say also no, that was always the original policy of this administration going in and their plan to announce sanctions and propose de-escalation discussions at a summit. That was the original plan of the people going in the administration that's not resultant from Russia's military deployment. So before anybody else asked it, did Biden then come after the deployment and offer him a summit as like the reward? The answer is no. All right, so then how about, here's a couple other uh, potential drivers of this um, from Elise Giuliano. One was about, is this a story of Putin trying to signal to Zelensky that um, Zelensky doesn't get to assume the initiative over negotiations with Donbass and only Putin gets to, you know, Putin sets the term for the negotiations and or is it potentially a response to uh, that Ukraine should not have been pro-Russian television channels in Ukraine? Do either of those, if the, if the, if the killer comment doesn't ring particularly true, do either of those seem it as important factors? Paulina, do you want to? Ah, uh, you're still moving. Thanks. Well, um, yes, I think it was a sort of, uh, um, yes, it was a sort of signal to Zelensky that he is not really capable to resolve anything by himself. And uh, when um, Zelensky just uh, tried to call Putin, Putin uh, didn't pick up. And then when Zelensky suggested Putin to meet at Donbass and to discuss the fate of Donbass, Putin said that we are not there. We, you can, you're welcome to come to Moscow and we'll discuss our relations, but uh, there is not about Donbass, we're not there. So he shows that, uh, um, Zelensky is not um, able to resolve anything himself, that he is absolutely dependent on Moscow's will, and he showed Zelensky that. Uh, maybe trying to prove him uh, to be more complying with which was what Moscow wants, to be more complying with this uh, water supply, with the Donbass um, resolution or what Moscow means, agreements, and other stuff showing that uh, he is not a figure uh, at all. Um, I think it was uh, sort of uh, the way to Zelensky to show that he should know his, his place, uh, not to confront Putin and Russia um, in this regard. Because, you know, Zelensky, I think that he deceived the expectations of uh, uh, Russians because he came uh, to power with the slogan of, uh, you know, uh, bringing the resolution to Donbass conflict, the reconciliation. He is a Russian language uh, person. And everyone was expecting he will go to Moscow at once and, uh, you know, um, agree for everything Moscow suggests. But the situation, you know, around Zelensky is not the way he can do this, even if he wanted. Uh, so uh, actually, Zelensky uh, he really deceived uh, Moscow's expectations, and um, he is a figure of reconciling everything. He um, turned to be absolutely uh, useful, uh, useless for for Moscow. That is why I think that. And when Zelensky started to confront Putin recently, yes, just to to play this game, Putin just wanted to. Uh, to show him that he's he's nobody in this uh, in this resolution, and everything should be resolved out of uh, out of Zelensky without him. Did anyone else want to comment on that question as well? I guess the one thing I would throw in is that seventy five percent of the Ukrainian electorate did not think Zelensky was going to sell out Ukraine. So I mean, I would just say that uh, you know people thought that he might be able to negotiate. You know, everybody did not think he was going to go and sell out Ukraine or they would not have voted for him. Um, I also think that while I agree that Russia always wants to remind everybody that it has uh, the upper hand, I don't think that Vladimir Zelensky was under any illusions that he somehow magically did. Thanks, Olga. Okay, so the next question following a little bit is uh, from Ann Cooper asking, can somebody say something about how the media in both countries have covered this? We've talked about the Western analyst, what Western analyst takes on it. We've talked a little bit about what the take from, you know, from Ukraine, from, from Kiev, from Moscow. Um, what about the media in both countries? Tim, maybe, can you yeah. speak about it all? Sure. Very, I, I mean, actually, Michael might be able to uh, uh, respond to this uh, uh, as well, because uh, some people took the uh, very bellicose statements uh, by members of the Russian media. Um, I believe it was Kisilyov who mentioned uh, uh, nuclear weapons, right? Uh, 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 you know, could be exploded around, you know. 
Kiselyov has a real soft spot for nuclear weapons, apparently. You know, he reminded us that, you know, Russia was the only country that could turn the, the U.S. Into, into nuclear ash. Um, and um, uh, so, you know, I would be interested to know, Michael, you know, from the anal you know, military analyst community took of these statements, but I think it made a lot of people um, uh, quite nervous. Uh, on, you know, on the Ukraine side, you know, I think Zelensky, uh, you know, he used the harder line against Russia to, you know, to help boost his popularity a little bit. Uh, you know, his popularity had been sliding for a long time. He hadn't had, you know, the kind of real noticeable achievements one would like uh, uh, to hang, uh, hang one's hat on. And it did have, you know, some facts of kind of stemming his, uh, uh, you know, his, his fall in support. Um, so, you know, it, the, the domestic politics here, I think, um, you know, in some ways worked in the opposite of, you know, of what some of the, the narratives were, where, you know, the notion was that Putin is doing this in order to, you know, boost his support, where I think it's probably more the case that Zelensky was doing it uh, uh, for this reason, in full recognition that, you know, the military cards were not in his favor and that he, he you know, was very limited in what, what, what he could do. Um, I you want to add on that? Yeah. Sure, sure, Josh. Uh, I'll just very briefly comment. So, um, at least from my point of view, watching R Russian statements and and those, uh, I personally didn't take much from them. I know media look to those, but most of the people, when it comes to military deployment like this, are completely irrelevant because they don't know what's going on. They don't know what they're talking about within the Russian information space. Mm -hmm. And that includes people like Peskov. You often see interviews with them, and he clearly has no idea what's going on that he's being asked about. So he's just sort of kind of making it up on the on on the spot. Um, eventually. What people like me look for, like what were key people like Shoyu or Grasm are going to say, eventually Shoyu came out and set down a marker saying that they would redeploy by the end of the month. And they were either going to begin visibly doing that or they would not. And those would then lead you to two different conclusions about their intentions, right? And when he said that, he set a marker, then you could see, and then when it became clear they were redeploying and they were essentially ending uh, that military buildup. Uh, on the whole, I think the other part of this crisis was characterized by Putin's expanded uh, ex uh, expected speech to the Federal Assembly and that people thought he might announce something there. And they weren't sure. Maybe he'd make an ultimatum on Ukraine. Maybe he'd make a demand. Maybe there'd be something about Belarus. If you remember, a lot of journalists were kind of piling on that something would happen that week and nothing happened. Literally, he didn't say anything, but it was actually one of the, it was all on uh, public administration issues and services and economy. So it was probably one of his uh, least interesting speeches. He made no announcement there. So that was the one week also where people were looking to see if Putin would say anything at that speech related to the situation, and he did not. Great. So let's take a couple of forward-looking questions. Uh, one is from uh, Professor Alex Modal, uh, who's in the audience. Uh, where will the Donbass and the Donbass War be five years from now? So people have thoughts about that. Another one is from Christian uh, Jojart, um, who asks about what do you expect in the next months and what is the purpose of closing parts of the Black Sea? Can it be a tool of economic pressure as we saw in 2018 for the Kerch incident? So I think uh, maybe we can focus on those two areas, what's going on specifically in the Black Sea area, as well as the military prospects in uh, the Donbass. Um, who'd like to start? Paulina, would you like to take one of those? And, and you're on mute, yeah. Yeah, maybe I would like to start <laughs> from Donbass because uh, I'm not sure that anything will, will change in the nearest five years because uh, Russia's positions are pretty strong in Donbass. You know, that there are like uh, almost half million Russian passports already sold there, plus Russian soldiers, plus people who just uh, removed from Russia to start a new life in Donbass. I also know that there are a lot of uh, uh, new people there and plus uh, you know um, the, we just you know noticed that this year will be uh, the children who were born in uh, Donbass and Lugansk people republics they would go to school for first class so this is the first generation who has never been uh, in Ukraine so actually the longer the conflict uh, lasts um, the more the less um, in common 
are between uh, Ukraine and the Donbas and Lugansk People Republics. They are much more close um, uh, by, of course, the information, um, the informational space, the mentality, the ide ideological propaganda to Russia. And more and more, the more soldiers of Ukraine uh, dies there, the, the less um, are the interests of uh, Ukraine to integrate them in, within um, the territory of Ukraine. So plus, of course, uh, if there was no uh, support of Russia, I think that the conflict could be resolved very easily and very quickly because having all this strong support, the Donbass and Lugansk People Republic would be more eager to negotiate with Kiev. However, as far as Russia keeps on supporting them uh, and uh, Ukraine would probably never agree for Minsk agreements but would, because it would uh, you know, actually uh, think um, Ukraine as uh, the country with uh, pro-Atlantic and pro-European uh, aspirations. I think it has the potential to last for a very long time, uh, at least since Russia stopped supporting uh, Donbass and Luhansk People Republics, uh, which is not probably end up soon. So I think that in five years it will be sort of the same situation, maybe maybe less tense, maybe more tense. Of course, if any, nothing uh, you know extraordinary happens in this. Um, if nothing extraordinary happens, I mean, uh, which can lead to the um, escalation, uh, because I think that no one wants this escalation. However, it can happen because of some kind of extra uh, reasons, sudden reasons, uh, human factor or so on. Uh, but I'm pretty much pessimistic as for the resolution of the conflict in the nearest years. Yeah, I think that's... Thank you, Paulita. Anyone else want to take on either Donbass or Black Sea prospects? Michael. I, mean, I can comment very briefly. I'll say that uh, I, I agree with Polina. I think that probably Donbass is going to be de facto annexed by Russia and all by name in terms of integration. And uh, probably will look something like what would Transnistria look like if it wasn't separated from Russia by Ukraine, but actually on Russia's borders, right? And how hard would it be to, to keep Transnistria from de facto annexation integration into the Russian economy and Russian systems? So that's most likely how we'll, how we'll end up looking. I don't expect that there'll be a serious escalation. Uh, I fundamentally believe that leaders use force because they feel they need to use force to achieve their political aims. That military incidents can be used by leaders as a cause of belly when they want to go to war. But if they don't want to go to war, then military incidents generally don't lead to much of anything. Um, so that's the reality of it. Uh, on the Black Sea, I think, yes, it's a tool of economic pressure, but it's a tool with diminishing returns. The more you use it, the more your target adapts, like most tools of economic pressure. So it's a, it's a diminishing tool that has some immediate effect, and eventually Ukraine will adapt to it and will adjust accordingly over time. I can just make two uh, uh, quick points. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with uh, Paulina and Michael, and we're already starting to see some kind of institutionalization taking place of politics in Donbass with the passportization uh, policy of Russia. And I, I just was reading this morning that uh, United Russia uh, has, has said that they will back some candidates for local office from the so-called Union of uh, Volunteers of the Donbass which are the, they have headquarters in you know, most regions within Russia. And uh, you know, you know, the pro-government party says that they have the, uh, an open door for candidates um, uh, sponsored by these union on, union of Donbas volunteers, which I thought was, um, you know, pretty you know, pretty interesting for a region where Russia is, you know, doesn't have any official uh, uh, presence uh, on the on on the ground there, apart from the you know volunteers. I also want to make one point um, give, to give a little more perspective. If we go back to 2014, when you know the annexation of Crimea happened and, and the fighting broke out in eastern Ukraine, and sanctions were levied, um, most predictions were, well, these sanctions are going to last a year, 18 months. Europe is so tied in with the Russian economy that eventually the Europeans are uh, uh, are just going to, you know, they're just going to cave. You know, that was a that was a pretty broadly held assumption. And, you know, due to MH17, 
the Skripal poisonings, the the events in uh, uh, you know the um, in, in Czech Republic at the the explosion at the the arms depot, you know all of these reasons just keep the sanctions in place uh, uh, seven years on. So if anything, you know the um, events have have created a momentum uh, to buttress uh, the status quo, um, uh, which I think was not at all expected you know, seven years ago when the conflict first broke out. I'm going to jump in really fast. Just um, first, I, uh, Tim, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure the Union of Donbass Volunteers are Russians who fought in Donbass. So it's returning fight. Yeah, I mean, and right. it's a rush. It's a Russian domestic issue, yeah. right? What to do about them and how you deal with them. It's not really about Ukraine um, per se. And it's not it, you know, it gets complicated and it's all about issues of patriotism and also what do you do with right. um, returning fighters of various stripes. Um, two other thoughts that I have, um, and I'm a political scientist and, you know, so I don't predict the future. I explain it's an inevitability after it has, uh, you know, come to pass. I, I therefore won't predict. I will say that um, if, if Ukraine gives up on Donbass, right? If Ukraine decides these aren't our people, that as Paulina said, they don't, they haven't, these children have never lived in Ukraine rather than these children have been living in occupied Ukraine, right? Which I think is the official party line still. Um, then, you know, you do have to wonder what happens to the Minsk agreements. You do have to wonder how exactly you square that circle diplomatically and bureaucratically. And you have to wonder what Ukraine's been fighting for all this time. Uh, and I think that I think that's an important question for the Ukrainian polity writ large, including those people who voted for Vladimir Zelensky um, a couple of years ago. And then the final thing I would say is the resolution or lack thereof of Ukraine, and I think uh, Tim alluded to this, is really tightly tied in to West Russia relations. Um, you know, these things move in lockstep. And there is desire, if not a clear view, to solving this somehow. So while, yes, there is certainly a very strong possibility that things will continue along in the re really unpleasant way they've been continuing up until now, with some advantages to some people, but overall pretty unpleasant, particularly if you happen to live in these areas, um, there is also a chance, I think, um, not of inadvertent escalation, but of actually sitting down and trying to find ways forward uh, that people could accept. And again, I see the Russian escalation this spring as a sign that the Russians aren't quite as happy with the status quo as we thought they were, which I would see a bit as an opening. I'm not going to get all optimistic about it. Um, I'm sure we will find a way to throw away this opportunity as well. But, uh, you know, I, I would at least point it out that it might exist. Great. Thanks for that. And uh, Michael, I, I, a specific question to you from Michael von Ginkel, who asks, um, could you go in more in depth into what equipment was left behind and why Russian explanations related to the Zapad exercises aren't sufficient? Can't go into depth because they haven't left it yet and I'm not physically there. So that's the challenge for me. My house is in Mount Vernon, Virginia and I'm not in Voronezh. But uh, to be perfectly honest, what I think they likely left behind is elements of two brigades and an artillery brigade that they had there from the 41st Army. And we don't know which ones. I don't think it's a substantial amount of equipment. Why did they leave it behind is a good question. So if they left it behind, it means they can very easily bring back the personnel to fall in on top of the equipment, right? It's their preposition. Do they really need it? Do they need it to back uh, the forces they have there, the 20th or the 8th Army? No. I've heard some people make this argument. They don't need it all. There's plenty of Russian military power already there. So it's not clear why they left it. Maybe they left it uh, as some kind of warding signal. Does it make sense that they really need it ahead of Zappa 2021? You know, potentially they could generally be trying to save money because they intended to shift units from Central Military District to participate in this uh, command staff exercise that takes place in September. And somebody said that rather than paying the money to truck it all the way back and then truck it all the way back forward again, they should just leave it there. 
This may seem like a silly explanation, but uh, spending some time in defense military circles, or at least on the defense civilian side of it, I can tell you that that explanation could actually be in part genuine, but it's not clear yet. So they could have had plenty of time to bring it back and forth several times between now and September. As for Crimea, they're not really leaving anything behind, but they did have a, an announced scheme to uh, deploy an airborne regiment there. So they're essentially converting an airborne brigade and parking it there as a regiment. They have been keeping one battalion there for the past several years, and they're now just expanding into that. So that's not really a case of leaving it behind. I think the 56th Airborne Brigade is going to stay there. And by the end of the year, it's becoming a permanently based airborne regiment in Crimea. So that's just a four structure expansion in terms of what's based in Crimea, which has already been announced. Uh, I'm not seeing a lot more than that actually being left behind in Crimea. I actually think they withdrew or, or withdrawing most of what they had originally deployed. So having zoomed in really deep into the weeds on that question, maybe for our closing question, and we'll, and the panelists can, you feel free to use this opportunity if you want, if there's anything else you had wanted to say before you hadn't gotten a chance to say, but for our closing question, maybe zoom out a little bit. So we got a question from Pavel uh, Devyatkin from the Arctic Institute asking about um, what the implications of what's just gone down on the Ukrainian border have for Russia's foreign policy outside of this particular region. So for example, does this signal, you know, does this signal a new era of a more assertive foreign policy in regard to the Arctic or regard to other areas of the world? So is there anything we take away from this just kind of zooming out a little bit, or is this just, is this, you know, is our main takeaway here? There were some issues having to do with Russia and Ukraine's relationship. Russia made a demonstration of power. It's now moving on in a slightly different direction than maybe if it hadn't made that demonstration of power. Or does this have anything to say in a larger vein about Russian foreign policy? Perhaps, you know, Russian foreign policy in the Biden era, um, you know, because this all is, is this is all taking place shortly after the new US presidential administration um, or, you know, or more generally. So I'll leave it to that. And if that's not the question you want to answer, we we do have about uh, you know a few minutes left before the end of the panel. So if there's some other pressing point you want to make, that's fine too. Paulina, yeah, you're muted. So, but if you want to go first, I just uh, maybe this is not a very much very correct analogy, but I had an analogy with the. Um, a Cuban Missile Crisis time when, uh, you know, the young President um, Kennedy came to power and uh, Khrushchev just wanted to test his resolve and to show um, that, you know, to prove that, uh, you know, the word of Soviet Union matters and the Soviet Union a really powerful nation. Well, there was a number of reasons, of course, but anyway, not to dig into. And uh, this was, and, and you know, that Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, you know, showed that uh, President Kennedy passed that test um, even better than uh, Khrushchev. Um, but at the same, uh, so uh, and now we have a new, very, not so young President Biden, who is a very much experienced politician. Uh, however, um, I think that in Russia, the um, perception and the um, expectations of Biden coming to power were pretty much pessimistic. And um, the, the, the main idea was uh, that the uh, policy uh, and the relations with Russia would deteriorate and that Biden would uh, make a lot of harm to Russia's interests everywhere. So Biden have somehow, you know, started to prove these ideas plus this, you know, um, the fact that he agreed with the fact with the, that Putin is a killer and so on. So it was even worse than uh, Russia expected. And then I think that probably uh, this escalation was uh, the attempt to you know, change the uh, grade of relations. You know, everything became much better after the Cuban Missile Crisis between Soviet Union and uh, the United States. So it was also the uh, way to, you know, to hit the grade of uh, um, the relations just maybe to find the way out to push the United States to the dialogue because finally Cuban Missile Crisis pushed uh, Kennedy to the dialogue as well and he removed missiles from uh, Italy and Turkey and so on so anyway it was the attempt to show that Russia is um, is not a passive uh, um, nation uh, who is uh, going to tolerate you know crossing the red lines uh, they, they see and uh, at the end, uh, you know, it pushed uh, Biden at least to the uh, starting the dialogue, uh, 
in the dialogue with Putin. At least we'll see how it goes. But anyway, it was sort of a push. And I think that it was, um, it was heard in Washington, the signal. And maybe it was the sort of idea was uh, maybe the, the, the aim of the escalation was the bunch or certain of certain signals. And this was among them. So the start of the dialogue from the um, such a you know lower note um, may turn may at the end play um, in a better way it was expected before I think. Um. Thanks, Polina. Who would like to go next? Do any of the other panelists have any other closing words? I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go. Um, so I think um, to answer the question. Um, the, you know, does this have implications for the Arctic? I don't think directly, right, that Russia learned an important lesson here that it's now going to take to the Arctic. Um, I do think we are seeing and have seen for some time the militarization of Russian foreign policy. Uh, we've also seen for some time the militarization of American foreign policy, that military tools are good tools. Uh, military tools are useful tools. Uh, these are the tools we like. These are the tools we control. These are the tools we use. Um, the Arctic is one of the last places Russia is likely to go with that, to be honest. Um, you know, but in general, I do think it's one more example of that pattern. I do kind of want to respond to the testing Biden. That was certainly something I got um, a lot of folks asking me. Um, if so, I think it was serendipitous, much as, as Michael has already said, the plan for the summit was probably already in place and serendipitous. And again, yeah, it's this, there are all these things that were happening at the same time, and there's a tendency to try to connect them and to think that they're causal. And everybody walks away having thought other things are causal. So it is entirely plausible, right, that in the Kremlin, there are people who think, yeah, we freaked them out in Ukraine, and that's why they proposed the summit. I am equally confident that's not what the White House was thinking, right? Um, so signaling, right? Again, we're kind of back to people sending signals and reading other signals that weren't the ones that were sent. Um, I will also say, and again, I'm kind of just responding to Paulina a little bit that, um, man, this is a lot better than the Cuban Missile Crisis. I mean, good Lord, the Cuban Missile Crisis. I mean, you know, I wasn't there for it, but it sounds like it was really scary. Um, this was not that scary. I had, you know, I had some Ukrainian friends jokingly ask me if I thought, you know, they should uh, dig, uh, dig a bomb shelter, but they were joking. So um, I, I, probably, I, I don't know how other people's Ukrainian friends were, but um, this was not that um, and good right? Because that was really quite terrifying and it had some real risks. This didn't really have real risks. Um, and again, thank goodness. <laughs> Just uh, very quickly, uh, um, for the Kremlin, uh, to be sure the tone from Washington is much more assertive but at the same time, it's one voice rather than two voices. I think for the last four years, there have been two Russia policies. And you know, I imagine the Kremlin, they found that very difficult to deal with. So um, you know, I think these guys, you know, in some ways, I think that's a, a hopeful uh, a sign that at least that there is some necessary condition is in place for uh, you know, at least stopping the, you know, the or mitigating the worst parts of the uh, of the relationship, stopping the, the relationship from sliding uh, uh, even further. You know whether this is a turning point event. You know, if you look at Putin's address to the Federal Assembly or his address uh, yesterday on, on May 9th, you know it was remarkably devoid of uh, uh, you know kind of clear foreign policy goals. There were some kind of veiled references to. Uh, you know, right wing circles out there that, you know, threaten Russia, but it all kind of smacked more of a of boilerplate and even the red line um, remark that got so much attention was really not, uh, you know, the emphasis uh, of that speech. Um, and, you know, domestic commentators in Russia you know, didn't highlight that part. They highlighted all the parts, you know, the great majority of the speech was about uh, domestic politics. So I'm not sure that the footprint from this particular event is really going to have a, 
you know, a, a, a big impact. Great. Thank you, Tim. So folks, we are out of time. So we're going to have to call it there. Uh, thank you so much to Olga. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Paulina. Thank you, Tim, for joining us. Uh, thank you to the audience. We got over 100 at some point. So we appreciate you tuning in. Um, uh, Michael, that's right. You did not get the final. You did not get a final word. Do you want to say something quickly? Yeah, I have a meeting sure. right after this. Thanks a lot for inviting me. That's my final word. It was great being on this uh, on this webinar with you. Perfect. And a reminder to everyone: our uh, next one will be on June two thousand, uh, June fourteenth, rather. Uh, and we the topic uh, TBA. Uh, thanks again. Stay safe, everyone, and see you soon. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>